Awesome, Mike. Thanks for being back once again to chat. The uh, the last time we talked, it was October of 2020, and you had just come out with the call. And I think the day before you had debuted on uh, Days of Our Lives. Wow, Wait, doesn't that, that that feels like a lifetime ago? It's it feels like it feels like we're talking about a different person. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, you've been very busy since then. I mean, if IMDb is to be trusted, you have so many films either in pre-production or post-production, and you just shared one that you're going to to film soon. Um, things have been going well. Yeah, yeah, things have been going really well. Um, you know, days being on days and having the call come out um, sort of has opened up a lot of doors for me. Uh, I'm on This Is Us right now, that NBC show. Um, day, I, I was on days for like nine months, and then they killed me. Then they brought me back. Then they killed me again. And uh, so, so that's you know, that's always fun. Like, like what what other industry can you just die and come back and die and come back? Absolutely. And, um, and then, and then I I just had a slap face um, release uh, a couple of weeks ago on Shutter, and it's doing doing really well. I know we were we were talking about slap face. Um, Definitely. And that one I'm really really proud of, just because that was one from like soup to nuts. Like I found the script through a friend, uh, worked with the writer, director, Jeremiah Kip on getting the script to where, you know, we both loved it and, um, and then cast the film and raised all the financing and shot the film and oversaw pre uh, post-production and then sold the film. And like, like that, it, that's truly, truly my baby. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so the fact that the world has it now and, and is, is appreciating it and the feedback we're getting, I think we're still at like 90% on Rotten Tomatoes or something like that. That's awesome. um, it's really, it's really it feels really good. So talk about what drove you to that. You said you found the script and uh, you obviously had an affinity towards it. What, what, what was it about Slapface that kind of hooked you right away? Yeah, um, I can't remember if we talked about before. Um, a couple of years ago, maybe 2017, I had produced this film called MFA. Mm-hmm. And MFA was, it, it was sort of a revenge thriller uh, where Francesca Eastwood was our lead. And she plays this um this college student that is getting revenge on a bunch of frat guys um after she's sexually assaulted and for me that film was a perfect example of making a film that's fun not not fun but but commercial and it has everything that the genre should have so it has the the sexiness it has like the violence um but it also sort of transcends that and has a message to it an important message and after that film, I was I was actively looking for another script that would do that same thing. So for me, Slapface has everything that somebody would want to see if they're going to go see a thriller about a boy and his monster. So it has the monster, it has the the suspense, it has the stakes, it has the the violence. But for me, Slapface is really about anti bullying and about trauma and grief and. Um, and getting past that and what happens in the mind of a young boy when he has nobody to turn to uh, except for this witch that lives in the woods and so so for me that's that's really what um, what drew me to the script and what what really you know made me passionate about telling the story is the the anti-bullying aspect yeah it's it's a very layered film and everything you just described uh, it plays out from beginning to end it's funny when you first start and you you see Slapface right away, the game that you and uh, August play as brothers. Uh, you're like, what are you getting in? What am I getting into? What is this? What's happening here? Um, but by the end of it, I was really impressed with that. You play sort of another macho role here, ma- macho brother role of Tom. Um, kind of similar in a way, I guess, to Zach in The Call, if I'm going back to, to that last time we chatted. Do you enjoy sort of taking on these different personas like uh, of the, the tough guy, but has the heart in the end? I do. Uh, I do. And I actually had never made that connection until you just brought it up uh, with the two characters. But yeah, I think so. I think um, anytime that I play a bully or I, I don't think Tom's a bully, you know, in slap face, but I think that he, he definitely ha- approaches things with a, you know, sort of a shoot first, ask questions later, like a gravitas, uh, an aggression, a machismo um, that that he, in my opinion, inherited from his father. And and that's why the film also comments on like, you know, max masculinity and what it means to be vulnerable and and how powerful vulnerability can be if in the right situations and how necessary it is in other situations when, you know, when when Tom can't 
connect with his younger brother, Lucas, and all that they would need to really, in, in my opinion, like if Tom would have been a bit more vulnerable a bit sooner and really taken care of his little brother, a lot of the bad things that happened in Slapface Face wouldn't have happened. And so, you know, when I do play these characters, these, these bully machismo characters, I always try to infuse an element of the heart in that, um, just so that at the, by the end of the movie, the audience obviously knows what I did and sees what I did and whether it's being mean or ag aggressive or whatever, but at least they know why, at least they know where that comes from. Um, I'm a part of a, a, an organization called Buddha Bullying. And one of our main sort of like messages is like hurt people, hurt people. And, and so that's sort of what I try to, to do when I'm layering these characters is just show where that pain comes from that they are then inflicting on other people. Yeah. Yeah, I was very happy to see resources shared at the end of this too. I think that's always important when you're touching on such a, a prime topic. Um, talk about your your relationship with August uh, on set. You know, young actor, do you, you're a very personable guy just from the few times that we've talked. Do you find yourself uh, serving in like a mentor role uh, when you're on set with younger actors or is that something that interests you? Yeah, I think... Um... August, we, we struck gold with August. Um, so Jeremiah Kipp, our writer-director, uh, sort of made it his wish list for the, the role. We had a, a casting director, Carolyn Sinclair, and she made her wish list, and then I made my wish list. And August just so happened to be at the top of all of our wish lists. And so it was like very much like the stars aligning. He had, I, I knew that his work ethic was strong because he had come from uh, the Disney show um, Girl Meets World. And, you know, I also have worked for Disney before. And so I know how, how much they expect of their young actors. So I was like, okay, he's going to have the work ethic. He's going to show up prepared, be professional, know his lines, all of those things. But then he also was in The Nun. He was in the movie The Nun. And it was a small role, but he was still in the movie. And so he, in my opinion, he understood the genre um, and it wasn't just some Disney actor that we were getting. So for those reasons, you know, he was at the top of all of our lists and he had such a great experience on The Nun that he was looking um, for a lead role in a thriller like this actively. So it just was like the right place, the right time. Yeah. And when he said yes, we were we were just overjoyed. And he definitely delivered. Um, I mean, as you saw in the film, like Absolutely. he plays so many emotions for a 12 year old boy. Um, and he had to play those emotions or else you didn't, wouldn't connect with the character and sort of go on this journey with him. So he, every day, like showed up prepared. Uh, it, a lot of times I forgot that I was acting with a 12 year old because he was so <laughs> professional and so good and so on it. I was like, oh, this is my colleague, right? This isn't like some young kid. This is my yeah, colleague. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, he, we definitely bonded. Like the, the first day we're sitting on set and I told him I like comic books. And so he runs over and grabs a notebook and runs back and he shows me a comic book that he's, he's writing, like he's making his own comic oh, very book. Cool. And, and then he showed me some poetry he was doing and then some short stories and drawings. And uh, we just bonded like right away. And uh, it's funny, we were filming and we were filming through Thanksgiving, uh, not, not Thanksgiving, Halloween, wrong holiday. We were filming through Halloween. We started uh, right before, we ended before Thanksgiving. So we were filming like October, November, of 2019 in upstate New York and so we wrapped early one day on Halloween and we went to this like big Walmart that was nearby set and we bought costumes and August was Harry Potter I ended up ended up being this like green dinosaur like I have this like big onesie like that's like <laughs> the green dinosaur and we all went trick-or-treating and I remember standing back with my friend Nick one of the other producers and I'm watching August and Mirabelle who played Mariah um, and they're just walking along with like their little buckets, like being kids. And I was like, oh man, like I, throughout this process, I'm, I'm, I'm almost forgotten that I'm working with kids. Right. They're, they're so on it and so good. And also the, the material is pretty mature that we didn't really have, you know, have chances for that humor or that fun. Um, and then I was like, man, like they are kids. They're, they're just, I'm dressed like a big green dinosaur. We're trick or treating. Uh, <laughs> this is my life <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> That's very cool, though. And I, you're exactly right when you talk about August's performance in particular, because it, it is layered. It's it's highly emotional. And you can not only 
get that from the dialogue being spoken, but his physicality and sort of the way he reacts, not only in scenes with you, but also when he's with the girls, you know, in the woods and um, different aspects of that. So it's, you definitely struck gold with him and he really carries the film in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Just the dynamic that he has with everybody. Um, and I think, I think everybody brought their A game. Uh, Lucas Hassel was our monster. And when Jeremiah, he had, he was the monster in the, in the short film version of Slapface. And so when Jeremiah, he's like a six foot three man. And, um, and so when Jeremiah said, you know, I want to pitch him as our, to be our Virago, to be our witch, I was like, wait a second, this maternal motherly witch figure, you want to be played by this giant man? And, uh, and Jeremiah goes, yeah, 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 just trust me, just trust me. And that was actually something I was nervous about, even up till the first day we were shooting, because we couldn't recast him. And so I'm sitting there behind the monitor, day one, watching him, uh, August Maturo, re- interact with the witch, with Lucas Hassel. And it was just magic. It was magic. And, and the way that Lucas would mimic August and, and sort of as Virago and just sort of have this like scary, threatening presence, but also this maternal compassion and care. Uh, it was, it was, it was bizarre and it was weird, uh, but it was so important, I think, for our film. And then the way that August interacted with Mirabelle and the way that he interacted with the twins, um, the the Ambrosio twins, Bianca and Chiara the Ambrosio. Uh, it's funny, I actually met them. They play the bullies, Donna and Rose. I actually met them on an anti-bullying, uh, at an anti-bullying wow. board meeting that I was, a, we were all a part of at the time called Buddha Bullying. And, um, and so like, like it all just came full circle. Like they're playing the bullies in this movie and I, I've known them since they were nine and they're the sweetest girls. But the way that they, August interacted with them and the way that they pushed him over and pulled his ear and made fun of him. I'm watching the movie like, oh, these girls are jerks. Like, <laughs> what? You know, but they're not like that in real life, obviously. But, yeah. Yeah, like you play that really well. That's concerning. Yeah. Um, I'm really intrigued by the fact you've done a bit of horror and it seems like you're that you kind of steer that way a little bit with some of the projects that you've had come out in the past couple of years. Um, but I'm really intrigued by the fact that you, you pick these, these films that have, I keep saying layers, but essentially that's what it is layers to them. So you're, you said earlier, you have a genre film that hits on all the different marks that you would expect from that type of film, but then hits you with an emotional aspect or theme. Um, is that something that you look to continue doing with horror in particular, or are you branching out into other dramatic roles? Yeah, good question. Um, I think so far in my career, I mean, I've been in LA almost 12 years now and producing sort of found me. I moved here for acting. I, uh, I worked my butt off and I, you know, I did Disney stuff and I did some TV stuff. And then, you know, luckily uh, the acting stuff's been pretty consistent um but also throughout throughout my career so far uh projects on the producing side have just sort of found me um and and you know and I'll meet filmmakers and sometimes I'm in in those films as an actor sometimes uh there was this film called Gin that I that I helped produce um that premiered at South by won the festival uh it was a coming of age story about a young black girl living in California who hasn't really experienced discrimination for being black, but then her mother is a weather woman, a, lo- a weather woman and um, wears a hijab to uh, deliver the weather because she converts to, to Islam. And, and, and that's a story about, you know, ha- has all the elements like you're talking about of like a coming of age film yeah. and, you know, finding yourself and everything else. But that film is about discrimination towards the Muslim community. And, and so it's just like, and, and in, that, in that circumstance, I met the writer director. It was a story that was loosely based on her own upbringing, her own life. And I said, wow, the story, this is an amazing story. The world needs this film. Uh, I want to make it happen, but I have no place in this film. Like I don't have, as an actor, I don't have a, a character in this film, but I still want to make the movie. And, and so I've, so far these projects have, have just found me. Yeah. Um, so I'm not really sure, you know, if, if I have, intentionally sought out different genres or different whatever but um yeah I just I, I basically am just keeping my ear to the ground and looking for other projects um that like you're talking about that are layered that have everything that somebody would expect from the genre but um you know but that but that actually say something you know like for me slap face is is almost like et like et 
if you were going to see a movie about a boy and his alien, you, you it checked all the boxes. You know, it, it had the heart, it had the, you know, the, the cool special effects and everything else. But that movie was about divorce and the broken family unit and how, you know, he like Elliot felt like he he didn't have a father figure and he didn't have other people to turn to. And he befriends this alien that also sort of feels like he's um, at the time, you know, Spielberg talked about how um, at the time, you know, he he made E.T. about the divorce that he and the separation from his father that he had experienced. And like and I feel like, you know, that's film has a way of doing that to us. Pan's Labyrinth is yeah. that has that fantastical element to it, but it's about war and and about how that affects you know children and imaginations and things like that. So it's like that's what, what I try to do with Slap Face. And I and I think I guess a longer way to answer your question. Uh <laughs> I think that I'm hooked now. I think that my expectation moving forward with projects that people want me to produce, I'm pretty I, I, I think I need those layers that, that we're talking about. Yeah. yeah and, and I love hearing that because I think it's easy to make, not easy, but you know what I mean? In terms of a, a story, that's just a straightforward horror or something of that sort, but having an intentionally an, an intentional and intelligent subplot or theme that really, um, and even in the case of slap face, multiple themes here mm -hmm. uh, that really leaves you thinking about what you just watched, I think is one of the benefits to having such great content that we've been able to to see in recent years especially i think we're getting more intentional projects that are telling stories that haven't been told before from underrepresented individuals and i think that that's that's phenomenal so i'm i'm happy to to see that thinking when it comes to the work that you're doing uh behind the scenes that's really great Thank you. um in terms of slap face, so you mentioned earlier, it's on Shutter. What do you hope people take from it? We mentioned bullying, we mentioned grief um, as themes that are here, but what do you hope that people take away at the end of their, their screening of it? Yeah, I hope people get that entertainment that they're, see they're seeking. I, get, I hope that they get that escapism, um, especially now with what's going on in the world. I, I hope that they get that, um, you know, that they, they walk away feeling something and, and having stepped into that world um, for, you know, an hour and a half of their day. Um, I also, yeah, I, I hope that it makes them think about grief and trauma and loss and th those layers and the elements, um, you know, of, of that, especially in the, in the mind of a young boy who's so impressionable. Um, I think that maybe, you know, it's, it's always like, like, to me, one of the main messages of the film is like, you never know what somebody's going through on the inside. And they might be able to hide it. They might be able to put a smile on their face. They might be able to be like Tom and be that machismo guy and, sh and go to work and probably not talk to any of his buddies about how depressed he is because he doesn't have his parents around anymore. Like, Man. so you never really know what somebody's going through on the inside. And you never really, if, if unchecked, you don't know how that's going to manifest itself. The, one of our, our taglines for the movie is like, where do monsters come from? Monsters come from pain. And, and it's kind of crazy that somebody said this in another conversation I was having, and I never thought about this, but it's almost like one of the most, one of the characters that you understand and almost root for uh, the most, uh, one of the most sympathetic characters in this movie is almost the witch, yeah. because the witch is coming from a place of, of like, you know, you know what you're getting. The witch is the witch, right? The witch isn't trying to pretend to be something else. And the witch is doing it to protect this little boy. And and um, and I was like, wow, that's really, I never thought of it that way. But the witch is almost the most sympathetic character in the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess that's that's what I hope people take away from it. It's just making them think. Um, let me ask you this. I'm gonna turn this around on you. Uh, so do you think the witch is real or not? So I had that thought and I was going to ask you offline um, about that. I, for me, I think I, I side with it, not with the witch not being real. Mm -hmm. However, there's scenes at the end that make me question that. Um, but I don't know if that was intentionally shot to be question, uh, you know, left up in the air at the end. Definitely intentional. We, we want, we want, we want it to serve both opinions equally um, so that if people truly believe that the witch was real, um, and did all those bad things, then then there's evidence to support that. If they believe that the witch was all in his head yeah. um, and, and sort of a manifestation of his grief and his trauma, uh, we wanted to support that as well. So um, 
Yeah, well, yeah. I, I have a question about that, which I guess gets into a little spoiler territory, though. Um, with one of the victims that we see, how would that play out if the witch wasn't real? Then it was done by... It, it's isn't it scary that a 12 year old boy is capable of doing that yeah that's exactly where i was going with it as you were just talking yeah um because i guess that would be the only other solution or only other answer there huh? yeah which makes it which makes it terrifying yeah in my opinion see like that's what's wild about a movie like Slapface. you know on its on the surface you start off with you and august slapping each other and mm-hmm. here we are, you know, uh, two weeks after I saw the movie and we're talking about the different themes and how it, play, how it could play out, depending on your, you know, your perspective of the film. That's wild. And I, I love that. So congrats on being able to bring such a, a conversation starter um, to Shudder of all places, too. That's a wonderful distribution platform, I think, for this film. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The, the fan response and the audience response has been pretty positive so far, and, and people really seem to be. Um, you know, even from, from when we premiered at CineQuest and then won the, won the audience award, um, you know, it was, everything was online because it was, we were in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. So, uh, so they, but then even at that point, and then we went to Grimfest and Frightfest in the UK. And, and I, to be honest with you, I was surprised at just how much people and critics and reviewers and audience members and everybody were, they were exactly you know doing exactly what you're saying in terms of digging for those themes and finding those themes and finding those layers and commenting on them and one guy said that it was uh it was one of the best film films that he's seen in years and it made him cry and he had to watch it again and it made him cry the second time and and i was like wow like i didn't i didn't set out to 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 make a thriller that would make people cry (laughs) but um but it kind of does a little bit it's kind of sad I mean, I think about grief in general and, you know, once the uh, the ceremony of, of grief is over, that's a weird way to put it, but once a funeral is over and people move on, th- there's people still left grieving. And in this case, so isolated, the two brothers, um, it's it's a really fascinating uh, a journey that the film takes us on to just dive into what that looks like. And especially with Tom now, you know, being the, the father figure for all this character of Lucas. Um, that, sounds, that sounds like a really bad b- emo band name ceremony of grief ceremony of grief yeah, yeah. I, we'll sometimes i have a way with words grief. yeah <laughs> hey let me ask you two fun questions since we've talked before first of all anything you've watched recently or anything that uh you're really big on that's coming out soon um i really love i mean i'm i'm a binge watcher and i really love my like netflix coming home and watching netflix or yeah. you know amazon or, or whatever hulu um, so like Ozark is like is one of my favorite shows and just the suspense and the the pace and everything. Um, I, I've also started watching this. I'm really big into superheroes, yep. and and we were talking about representation and 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 um, having shows and film film and TV that are sort of giving narratives to underrepresented communities. Uh, there's this Netflix show called Raising Dion. Yep, and it's uh, I think Michael B. Jordan I think is executive produced and helped create the show, and it's about this young like black boy who's like his own superhero, and just the way that they tell that story, and it's and it's very much about this this young boy, but then it's also about his single mother that is is trying to raise him, and sort of all the 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 hardships of being a single parent. Um, but also like now he has superpowers and how does she navigate that and do that? And it's, it's really, really well done. So that's one of my, I, I'm, I love TV. I love entertainment. I love movies. I love TV. I'm watching a million shows right now, but those are two that if you ask me that, they come, come to mind. That's awesome. And on the superhero front, because you are a comic book fan, you are a superhero guy. The world is dominated. The world of cinema is dominated by Marvel, DC, all this stuff. If Mike Manning had the opportunity to pick a role in Marvel or DC to play, who would you pick? Oof. Oof. <laughs> um, I would be, well, because it just came out, I would be Jonathan Kent, super, Superman. Jonathan Kent, Superman. Uh, son of, son of kal uh, Bisexual. Uh, he falls in love with the, the photographer, sort of like Superman did with Lois Lane, like the Clark Kent, Lois Lane reporter romance kind of thing um i have i think i have on wait, wait. 
have all of them right here. Oh, look at you. <laughs> yeah, this is the whole the whole series, the whole um so far. It's uh like son of son of Kal El, the Jonathan Kent. Um I just think that that's such a like the way what they're doing with his character, making his character bisexual and making his character um he's like lobbying for climate change and equal rights and all these things. It's just such a cool character to be. Uh plus he has superpowers. And so uh so that's that's if I could write my own role, that's what I would who I would be. That's awesome. In terms of your work coming up, anything you want to tout before we close? Uh yeah. Um I, I'm on This Is Us right now, which has been so much fun. The um, Manny, right? The Manny. The Manny, I'm the new Manny, yeah. So Justin Hartley plays Kevin, who was the old Manny. And now I'm I'm the new Manny and, and working with Justin and everybody there has been really, really cool. Um, super, super cool like team and crew, and Justin's a really nice guy. Um, and then I just finished this, uh, this film with Randy Couture, um, a couple months ago, two, two months ago, one month, I don't even know what month (laughs) it is, but I just finished that one and that's called the bell keeper. So that'll be coming out. Um, and then I'm shooting another film that I co-wrote in Montana in a couple weeks. Um, so I'll post about that whenever I'm allowed to. And if people want to follow me and keep tabs, then they can. Yeah, awesome. Hey, Montana is going to have some beautiful scenery. So I can't wait to see that with uh, the project. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike, always a pleasure talking to you. I thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, I hope people definitely tune in uh, to Shudder to check out Slapface because it is, as is evidenced by this conversation, a very deep and thought provoking thriller uh, that I think people would be surprised by. Thank you, Joe. That means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Absolutely.